You have this amazing power to move people, not just to think, but to feel. When did you realize you had the ability to do that? I think everybody has the ability to feel, right? You know, that, that wasn't a, a great gift. I think I just feel so much, and I feel so much what people feel. Um, when uh, my youngest son, I remember when I was really young even, uh, came in and he'd bring his friends and go, watch my dad watch this movie. And I'd be like, you know, don't open the door. You know, I just can't help myself. I feel what they feel. And so that produced a lot of drive in me to help people when they were in pain because I feel their pain. And even when I was a little kid, I mean, my mom reminded me when I was like four years old, I'm in this backyard and there was a, a woman next door I used to call young lady and she was 80 years old. But, you know, seeing her light up when I called her young lady, I got hooked on at four or five years old. So... I love that, and because I'm driven for that, my lifetime has been about how to help people, how to help people achieve what they want, break through, discover things, and you could be an idiot if you spend three or four decades, in my case it's been three and a half decades now, you know, being obsessed about that, and then when you get rewarded all the time, because people, you know, people are incredibly generous when they feel like you've touched their life, they, they send out a lot of love, and I'm a love bug, so I got hooked on that at a very early, early stage of life, and I still am. You specialize in a lot of different areas, health, business, politics, sports, all kinds of areas. Of all the areas, what's the most challenging to move people, to move people to be active in their own rescue? It's a great term, active in their own rescue. You and I both have some history with that one, right. going down the Colorado River. It's right. a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody has their hooks. Everybody's different, Peter. Um, you know, some people, yeah, it's their business, their finances. You know, if that gets hooked, it's like their identity is tied to that. Uh, for other people, it's their body. They just feel like it's impossible. They can't change anything. They've, they've gone into learned helplessness, where they just have literally learned that they're helpless. They can't do anything about it because they failed so often. Um, but if I had to pick one that probably is most fraught for people overall, it's really intimate love and romance because you can control your business to some extent because you can control you. You can control your finances to some extent, right, by your choices. But you can do everything you want to do in an intimate relationship, and it can still blow up in your face because you can't control another human being. And if you could, you'd have no relationship. So, and I also think that if there's a story that all human beings have, it's the story of fear. We all have what we're after, but everybody has fears. And I've been with, you know, 4 million people now from 100 countries over these, you know, 33, 34 years I've been involved with people now. And I can tell you all roads lead to Rome. Whatever you're afraid of, you're afraid of failing or succeeding or whatever the case be, it really comes down to a fear that we're not enough. And if we fear we're not enough, our ultimate fear is if we're not enough, we won't be loved. Who can produce that fear in you more than somebody whose love you crave? Somebody that you really want them and they all of a sudden don't love you as much anymore? It crushes the soul. So most people have these plans like I'll be successful and then I'll know I'm enough regardless of what someone else does to me or you know, I'll be strong enough or physically beautiful enough. But of course, all those things are relative and none of them last. So getting people to have the courage and the faith to realize there, there is no security in life and there's no security in relationship. There's only what you can contribute. There's only what you can create. Right. And getting people to that place is not an easy thing to do, but when they do it, it opens up a whole new universe because when somebody's in love, you know, what's wrong with your life? <laughs> you know, nothing, you know, oh, what a beautiful morning, doesn't matter, you're silly as hell. But when they don't have that love in their life and everything else is going well, they still come to that empty place inside at the end. And that's the place where the most successful people on earth that have been clients of mine, you know, everybody thinks is so incredible. That's where they're lonely still very often. And that's the area that you got to really dig in to help someone. Do they usually have a story that happens to them very young which is kind of a, a backstory or a seminal element that is still present in them 10, 20, 30 years later and preventing them from exercising those talents? Well, nothing's preventing them, but they choose to go back to that story, right? Because how many stories do we have in our lives? But we have certain seminal ones that have so much emotion wrapped up into them, so much pain, so much hurt, or so much excitement that they shape us, and everybody's got those. I always say, change your story, change your life. Because whatever your story is becomes the shaper of all your perceptions, what you're going to try or not try, do or not do. The problem is most people are so addicted to telling that same story over and over again, it does become their prison. And so the answer is yes. I think the oldest story is that all of us were loved unconditionally when we were born. Uh, you know that even if you thought you had the worst mother in the world because 
you know, if a baby doesn't have someone willing to love them, that is means take care of them above their own needs. There's no rewards for a mother, ooh and ah, for all that stuff, for a father, ooh and ah. You know, we, we feel it because we're on drugs. We got oxytocin in our body. As soon as we're, a woman's pregnant or a father's there and he sees his child, that biochemistry changes in us and we love that thing even though it looks like a lizard, right? It doesn't right. matter. We know it's our kid. So, but that doesn't last forever. There's a stage in your life where you could yell, scream, throw stuff, smack people, and you still were taken care of in love. But then there's a day when that oxytocin wears off and suddenly somebody yells at you or hits you or even worse, ignores you. And that's the moment when the ultimate story is, what do I do to get that attention back? What do I do to get that love? And so some people, you know, they suddenly try to crawl or walk and everybody goes, look, Johnny's walking and the story is, I'm an achiever. I do things so I'm significant enough to get attention and love. Some people break stuff and people come and they learn if I destroy stuff, that's my story, then I'll get unconsciously this love. Some people, you know, they go, they make some noise and everybody laughs, make some noise, and a comedian's born. So that story, that experience becomes the story of what I've got to do when I feel uncertain that I'm significant enough to be worthy of attention and love in this life. And I'm oversimplifying it, obviously, because we've had a lot of series of stories in our life. But if we can go back and reclaim who we are today instead of living an old story, everything in your life changes. And that's a part of what I do. I recall the President of the United States calling you. Remember, you were going to see Princess Diana, Mikhail yeah. Gorbachev, all these people, extremely successful, extremely talented. Did they all have backstories that ran them? Did they all have some element in them, despite their success, that was still in the back of their head, still telling them, you're not good enough, you are good enough, or some, some element of their life that wasn't working because of that? Well, I don't always get the call because somebody's got, you know, some emotional problem or challenge. You know, when the president called, you gave me a lot of crap for what I said to him at that time, which was, I said something like, you know, I'm really appreciative of your calling, and, but I'm not a fan at that right. stage. Uh, so if you still want to hear from me, I'd love to come and do some coaching with you. So I was rather direct with him. But no, um, everybody's got parts of their life that shape the way they look at today and how they behave today. Everybody does. Everybody has a backstory, multiple backstories. The question is, which one's running you now? But what I'd say the common backstory for the successful people is hunger. Something produced drive in them. If you say, what's the difference between human beings and how they perform and how they show up, it's not intelligence or ability. You can find somebody of plenty of intelligence and ability and they don't maximize. They can't fight their way out of a paper bag. And then you find this other person that finds this hunger inside. You have it. I have it. Almost anyone we know who has done something they're proud of in their life or they feel good about in their life, they had to get through all the obstacles. They had to get through their own limiting stories. And so there had to be something they wanted more. That hunger often comes from a story of frustration or pain or desire. And finding that touchstone and igniting it is how you often can take somebody who's not driven and hungry and really help them to change their life. Do you think that people are empowered when they hear that somebody of that high stature also has some of those same problems and some of those backstories that are handicapping them? It's a great question. Um, some people are. Some people use it as a reason to hang on to their old story. Ooh, very cool. Right? Because yeah. they go, well, if, I, if Bill Clinton has that experience, right. you know, if you know, Tony Robbins has that experience, then what the heck am I going to do? And that's, that's part of the challenges. It's like, I remember one time... Um, it was, it was fascinating. My own sister, um, something was going on. It was challenging and everything else. And I said, you know, how come you didn't call me? And she goes, well, because you're Tony Robbins. <laughs> like, what does that mean? She goes, well, you can handle it. You know, I was going through a really rough situation. I had a similar experience with one of my boys, with my, my son Josh one time. He says, well, Dad, you're Tony Robbins, right? People make up this story because they don't know the real backstory. You know, you and I know each other's backstories. Mm -hmm. You and I know that we didn't just show up this way. Um, we've had a lot of gifts in our life, but... Phew, We've paid the price to do it, and we've found a way to add value throughout life, and that's why we have the privilege to be here. But if you start thinking that everybody's messed up, then it gives you an excuse to stay messed up. Wow. Versus my view is, let me tell you what these people overcame to be where they are. Right. That's what I'm more interested in, so that you and I have something to aspire to, because stories will either give you some form of aspiration, some inspiration, or they give you an excuse to stay where you are, or even make it worse. When I see you on stage or on television or on any, you know, interviews, you're always, you know, on purpose, full of enthusiasm, full of, you know, appreciation for the gifts. Was there anything that you were insecure about when you were growing up that you felt, oh my God, this is going to, this could cripple me. 
you know, yeah, or it was something that you any really one thing. <laughs> How many of the one things you want? <laughs> um, now, Peter, I, uh, I have trained myself with certainty, uh, not just with stories, by focusing on when I did succeed and building those stories, but honestly, by building into my body that certainty physically, like driving it in myself. Um, I had so many fears. I mean, I had minestrone soup acne on my face in high school. I didn't feel attractive. I was, I was 5'1 my sophomore year in high school. That's a um, scary thought. Isn't it? That's a scary thought. I grew thought. 10 I mean, inches in a year. Well, the next guy that met you a year later, that's a scary thought, too. <laughs> well, what's a scary thought? You know, I was with you when I found out. Uh, you know, I, I had a tumor that made me grow like that, and I had no idea. So, you know, you go from 5'1 to 6'2", six six now 6'7". Six uh, people say, what's the difference? I always say personal growth, right? But it was a lot of personal growth, right? I mean, like, not only physically going through, but what I went through mentally and emotionally to make that happen. And so I had, I was the little guy. I wasn't that strong. I had quite a mouth. I wouldn't take squat from anybody. And it's like, senior guy come to me and get in my face. But I had a mouth on me, wouldn't take it, but I was slow and not that strong. I had a good combination, right? right. Um, but I overcame it mostly by saying, in the end, if I find a way to add enough value to somebody else's life and I'm totally sincere and raw, they may doubt it all they want, but if I do that for year after year, decade after decade, eventually I'm gonna get through to them. And my life has kind of panned that out. There's a large number of people, millions of people I've been able to serve that way, many of which who thought, oh, who's this idiot, this motivator, the big tooth guy? But then they see me work my guts out for someone and really create results day after day, year after year, and they start to go, hmm, maybe the guy's you know, the real thing. You know, that's, people get to judge that by results rather than by discussion. I did that. Yeah. I did that. I told you my story that yeah. I saw your stuff and I thought, oh my God. And oh, I saw it another and another time <laughs> another time. And then finally, at one vulnerable, vulnerable moment, yes. I, you know, I bit. You I know? got you when, I was vulnerable, when you were vulnerable. Uh, that's the right. <laughs> that was very vulnerable. You did. Yes, yes. You know, so when you're needy, that's when you'll need. You yes. know? And so, yeah, I, I do think that's true. The interesting element is that sharing the fact that you, didn't, you weren't you know, perfect and born that way, yeah. and we're ready, you know, you're ready to go from the go, yeah. is important because I think most people don't realize that they have the ability to tell a different story to transform themselves. Well, the best way is not for me to tell my story because, uh, you know, that's self-inflation. That's not my goal. My goal, as I think you know, is to show people actually making that change happen. You know, when I do a film and you see this person stand up and they're suicidal, and then you watch them turn around, and then the people do the follow-up three years later, five years later, and you see this person's life still change. When people see that over and over again, or they see relationships come together that are ending, or they see guys that were struggling in business, and now their guy is so successful, and they saw the moment it happened, and they see the follow-up, and they hear from the guy, then it starts to penetrate people that there's no free lunch, but there's some strategies that can accelerate your growth massively and your sense of fulfillment, your sense of enjoyment, because if you succeed, but you're not fulfilled, you failed. So those are the two missions that I'm trying to do, not so much with my story, but with thousands, actually millions now, stories of other people. Well, as a storyteller, one of the magic things that I watched you in the audience that I, that I learned from you was that you're a great story listener. In other words, mm. the idea is that you don't just hear people, you get people. And when people feel that they're gotten, that they're really heard in that unique way, empathetically, they, they engage in a different way. Yeah. Uh, is that a talent that you learned, or you just felt you had, or did you, did you really work on it, or was it something that you perceived? And how important is that skill in, a, in creating a relationship that is successful? Well, I'll answer your last question last. A lot of questions there. How important is it to be able to really listen? I mean, I think communication is hearing what's not being said. And if you don't have that, and all you do is take the words, you're gonna have a disastrous intimate relationship you're gonna probably have some really disastrous business relationships yeah. because most people don't speak what they're really feeling or saying most of the time. They're either scared to, afraid to, or they're hiding their agenda because they have another agenda. And uh, most of us have a pretty big BS filter in the world we live in today, but it's more than that. It's not saying, where are they BSing me? It's saying, what are they really feeling? What's underneath this? What's really going on? And that's really important to me. I don't care how big the audience is. I was, uh, you know, I do, you know, 30,000 person audiences, but an average size audience I did yesterday was like a little less than 3,000 people in Las Vegas. It was salesforce.com, it's a business group. It's this long room, as far as you can see, you know, over there at the Wynn Hotel. And I'm on these big screens, and there's guys way in the back. How do you get the guy in the back? I get off the stage, and I prowl. I walk through the crowd. I'm there, I'm talking, because what I want to do is I want to look <clears> in your <throat> eyes, 
and I want to feel what's going on, see it. I want you to know that I'm not some guy over there on the stage that's just talking at you. I'm going to engage you. And in, in any moment, I can strike and have that conversation. And so it produces a different energy in that room. It's not some passive listening, and it's not with me either. The minute they speak, I'm now zeroing in on what they're feeling, and I'm also saying, how does, who else does this relate to in the room, and how can I use their story to help other people simultaneously? So if you ask me, the listening part is better than the storytelling part. You can entertain people as a storyteller, but you can transform people if you can really understand what their needs are, listen, and sometimes just by the listening alone, people's lives can change. When you're on stage, or when you're dealing, coaching people directly, how important is it to really be interested in who you're talking with, as opposed to being interesting in telling your story? I, I, I think that one is, anybody who's honest knows the answer to that question, right? But knowing the answer and, and behaving uh. that way, <laughs> that's the big difference, right? We all know that if you're interesting, you might have a relationship that's on the surface. But if you're interested, you're going to go deep because you're going to follow up and ask questions, and the person is not just going to feel gotten or some fancy term. They're going to feel that real connection that's happening. Because we live in a world where there's so little raw reality. Reality television, we all know, is bullshit, right? So right. What, what, what is real anymore? And most right. people are so good at presenting that I think most people, they'd rather see the screw up. They'd rather see a presentation that's not as refined um, so they know there's something that's real underneath it. But I think if you're interested in them, you don't have to work on the presentation side because people can see the start stops that are really real and, and more importantly, they'll feel that connection with you. So, you know, your, your whole thesis in life is understanding that the story is what drives everything in life. It's, mm -hmm. it's what drives the influence of another human being. But the understanding of that person's story is more important than your ability to formulate your story. That's why I think in your book, one of the most valuable things, Peter, is the backstory. Right. Because um, sometimes you can find that backstory in advance, sometimes you can't. Right. But if you're watching and listening and asking questions, the backstory will show up right in front of your eyes if you're engaged with that person. If you've got some rehearsed little talk you're gonna do, you're gonna be in your head instead of being here. I call it uptime. If you're in uptime, I'm in you. Now to do that, I have to know enough things and have a large enough bank account of things I've investigated or I understand or I've talked about that I don't have to worry about what I'm going to say. I've got so many, like you've got so many life experiences that I have a good idea of what I want to talk about, but then when we get here, it changes. When I was in, at this seminar the other day, I had this whole thing I designed, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm nuts. I think things through, I design it, and then I never do what I've designed. My team, it's the big joke. You drop the script. I drop the script because when I step out there, I'm here and go, nope, that's not what's needed right, right now. And that's also why I'm never yeah. bored. I would be bored out of my mind if I was 33, 34 years doing this stuff and I was doing the same stuff. I've got pieces I know work, stories or examples, and I might even plan to use it. But when I get out there, I could see, nope, it's something else. And so it becomes art and alive uh -huh. instead of some devoid. You could have a tape recorder otherwise and right. just do this, right? Well, you know, it's great. She said the whole thing. You have to prepare ferociously. Ferociously. And then you're going to drop your script. Because you want the spontaneity, you want the aliveness, you want the eccentricity of things happening. Yeah. But when you see somebody telling their story and you're decoding it, or they're a business person, if they're not authentic, does it shine through no matter what they say? Well, I'd love to say yes, but I'm, I know I've gotten the wool pulled over my eyes, so that would be a lie. Wow. Uh, but I would say most of the time at this stage of my life, I'm pretty good at that. And I think most of us are. Uh, only because... Unfortunately, we've all been disappointed so many times that we have a little part of ourselves that's like, it's all BS. And unfortunately, that can become a filter to you not actually seeing somebody, experiencing somebody, because you have all your presuppositions, right, that are running your life instead of being here now. Um, but I'm a little bit more trusting, so I probably stay with it a little bit longer. And I've had so many people, you know, make up a story about me who never met me. Um, because also my style, I talk rapidly, and that's just me, I'm passionate, you know, you and I get together, it's like bam, 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 you know, <laughs> other people stand around and watch the two of us when we go have lunch or we go to the house or go skiing or whatever, um, and so I love that, I love the speed of our interaction, because my brain works so fast, so some people don't trust that, it's fast-talking salesman is their metaphor for it, as opposed to a passionate son of a something, you know, which is what I really am. You're an authentic son of a bitch. <laughs> I love you, thanks I love a you lot. Too. Love you so much, Steve.